and perhaps even to Hamilton himself spell out the implications of what he was saying. The main thrust was the idea that animals share genes with their relatives. So if I do something for my brother, let's say, um, then the genes that cause me to do it will survive in him. And so th there's a kind of, there is essentially a gene-centered process going on. Um, Hamilton didn't say anything as simple as that, but that's really the essential idea. Dawkins' real achievement was to make Bill Hamilton's work understandable to the general public. But in science, every solution poses new problems. Selfish genes may explain why one individual will make a sacrifice for a relative who shares its genes, but it doesn't explain selfless behavior beyond that intimate circle. Are animals only prepared to make sacrifices for the sake of near relatives? Humans are animals too, says biology, and in human society we see plenty of self-sacrifice for the sake of complete strangers. Firemen will even give up their lives for someone they've never met. So, are humans an exception to the idea of selfish genes? I think when applied to, well, for example, trying to understand altruism in bees and wasps and ants and so on, why do worker bees sacrifice themselves for the hive and so on, I think it's the only theory we have. It's the only game in town. Um, when it comes to explaining human altruism, then it manifestly isn't. The second hereditary system, the cultural one in which we teach people ideas and so on, is as important or more important uh, in determining how people behave than, than ju just their genetics. The human brain provides possibly the only departure, the only engine of departure from Darwinian principles, and it really does, and, and you can easily, I mean, the simple example is contraception. You're contradicting the Darwinian dictates every time you use a contraceptive. So it, it's easy enough to do. Darwinian natural selection puts into our brains mechanisms that cause us to feel pleasure from sex. Uh, in nature, feeling pleasure from sex is a sufficient guarantee that we shall reproduce. By using contraceptives, we can contradict the Darwinian dictate by getting the pleasure without the reproduction. A very, very anti-Darwinian thing to do. Um, we are using the pleasure mechanisms that Darwinian natural selection has built into our brains, and we're using those pleasure mechanisms at the expense of the ultimate Darwinian purpose, which is gene reproduction. In his most recent book, A Devil's Chaplain, Dawkins plays with a famous quotation from Darwin to hint that nature's ruthless cruelty is a kind of devil's brew, a hell on earth that only humans can rise above. A Devil's Chaplain comes from a quotation of uh, a letter that Darwin wrote to his friend Hooker in 1856. Um, Darwin says, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low and horridly cruel works of nature. Nature really is red in tooth and claw. Nature, the world of Darwinian natural selection, is a pretty nasty environment in which to live. And as a human being, I very strongly advocate that if we understand Darwinism, we should understand it as an object lesson in how not to live, in how not to conduct our lives. It's a lesson in how life came into being, including human life, but it's also a lesson in how we should not behave when organizing our own societies, our own politics, our own morals. So, the devil's chaplain might conclude, stand tall, bipedal ape. The shark may outswim you, the cheetah outrun you, the swift outfly you, the capuchin outclimb you, the elephant outpower you, the redwood outlast you. But you have the biggest gifts of all, the gift of understanding, the ruthlessly cruel process that gave us all existence, the gift of revulsion against its implications, the gift of foresight, something utterly foreign to the blundering short-term ways of natural selection, and the gift of internalizing the very cosmos
internalizing the cosmos? If you didn't know Dawkins was an atheist, you might think he was a deeply spiritual man. Maybe he's both. But he's certainly a stickler for logic and rationality. He believes only science can enable us to discover truths about the world. There's no room for a creator here, no room for a grand designer, as he made abundantly clear in his 1991 Royal Society Christmas Lectures. This is a flatfish, a halibut. Its ancestors once swam normally in the water like a normal fish does, like that. But the ancestors of the halibut settled down on the bottom of the sea, one side down. They lay on the bottom of the sea, and then now a modern flatfish moves along like that. You've probably seen them doing it. But when it did that, the ancestor found that one of its eyes was looking straight into the sand. Only the other one was looking up. And so gradually in evolution, the other eye, the one that was looking into the sand, migrated round the side of the head and came up to the top, with the result that the skull of the halibut is now an extremely distorted object. Now, anybody who was going to design a flatfish wouldn't do it that way. You'd do it like a skate, which is another kind of shark, which is also a flatfish, and it flattened itself, its ancestors flattened itself, by going onto its belly, so that both its eyes were looking upwards and it had no need to do any kind of distortion. But by some kind of historical accident, the ancestors of the halibut and the soul and the place all did it by lying on their side, and that meant that they had this distortion. So this is an imperfection in design, which is just the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had evolved, but is very much not the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had been created. This question of design is crucial. We all know by simply looking at a clock that it had a designer, a maker. There's no way it could have just sprung into existence all on its own. So, 